So the last definition before we get into the, the four groups, carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, is the definition of the word isomer. One of the things you're going to see with organic compounds is that you could have two or more compounds that have the same exact formula, but when you actually arrange them, they're arranged differently. Sort of like if I gave every single person 10 Legos and said build something. Every person would technically have the same 10 starting blocks, but you could put them together differently. And depending on what you built, the function of what you built might be different. It would be able to fit in different spaces, for example, than what somebody else built. So the thing with, or with um, isomers in our bodies is that isomers, because they um, are arranged differently, they may have different effects in our bodies. And one example that you're going to see when we talk about carbohydrates, for example, um, would be in a starch versus cellulose. Starch, if you think of starch, you usually think of things like potatoes, rice, uh, breads. Those are all starchy things. We digest starch. We have enzymes in our body that break it down. We break it down into sugars, and then we use that for energy. Cellulose, which is what uh, plant cell walls are made of, has the same basic formula as starch. But because of the way that it's put together, we can't digest cellulose. So cellulose, when you eat it, it's basically what we call fiber. It goes right through your body undigested. It's still good because it, it helps to push other things through your body. But technically, you couldn't survive just eating cellulose because you can't extract the calories from it. You do not have the enzymes necessary to digest it, so it just passes through your body. So this would be one example of isomers. This picture is showing two isomers. These are not isomers in our bodies. But if I was to just write the formula for them, I would see that both of them are C4H8. But in space, these look very different. The, this one has two methyl groups that stick off the same way. If I had it out on my desk, it would be kind of a big U-shape is what it would look like because these two little hydrogens would not take up much space. This one, on the other hand, would not be a U-shape. It would be shaped more like this, more like a straight line. In your body, if these were, for example, two isomers or something, they might behave very differently. Um, this is an example that your book uses of isomers. So this is, uh, there was a drug in the late 50s, early 60s called thalidomide. It's actually still used today. I was looking online and they use it for other things. But one of the uses of thalidomide in the late 50s, like 1959, 1960, is that they discovered that it, it kind of induced sleep and it was good for treating morning sickness in pregnant women. What they didn't realize is that thalidomide had two isomers. And when you see a picture like this, um, the little square in the middle is supposed to be like a mirror. They're saying that these two versions of thalidomide are like mirror images of each other. Sort of like if you were getting dressed in the dark and you put the wrong shoe on the wrong foot, you'd know. Like it doesn't fit right. So these two isomers have the same exact chemical formula, but they're arranged th three-dimensionally differently in space. Women took the drug. Um, during the first three months of pregnancy for morning sickness, what they didn't realize is that there was a second isomer of thalidomide. This isomer caused birth defects. So there was this huge number of children born with all kinds of birth defects, plus a whole bunch of children that were stillborn. Um, this was one of the birth defects that it caused was the short arms. I don't know the official name for that. But this was like a national crisis. There were like 5,000 children born with these birth defects um, in 1960, 1961. In the Billy Joel song, We Didn't Start the Fire, there's actually a line in that song that says children of thalidomide. It's referring to, to this thalidomide crisis. And I would say that there's still drugs like that on the market because we don't even know. All right, so that was just one example. That's obviously an extreme example, but isomers behave differently. It could be medications, but it could even be in the foods that you eat that your body reacts differently to. So like I said, we're going to be talking about four different macromolecules. Today, we're just going to focus on carbohydrates. That's our first one. So carbohydrate literally translates to carbon water, which makes sense because if you look at the formula of the base unit of every carbohydrate, it's a carbon and water. That's literally the formula for all monosaccharides, which are the building blocks of carbohydrates. And when I, this letter N here, if you're not familiar with this, so this could be replaced with a number, and you'd multiply that number by the carbons, the hydrogens, the oxygens. For example, um, one of the monosaccharides we'll talk about would be glucose, which has six carbons. If it has six carbons, or N is equal to six, then it would have
have 6 times 2, 12 hydrogens, and then 6 times 1, uh, 6 oxygens. All monosaccharides have the same base formula. It's a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. It basically boils down to carbon water. So let's try one. So what if it was five carbons? How many hydrogens would it have? Good. It would have ten hydrogens. And how many oxygens? Five. So all monosaccharides have this same base formula, CH2O to the N. And whatever N is, you would just multiply that out, and you see that it's always going to be a one to two to one ratio of carbons to hydrogens to oxygens. So since monosaccharides are the building blocks, I'm going to give you just a couple of examples of monosaccharides. There are others, but these are the main ones. Glucose and fructose. Glucose you've heard of. Glucose is the monosaccharide that's floating around in your body, in your, going to your cells right now to provide energy for you. Even if you don't eat a lot of sugar in your diet, you break down the other foods you eat into monosaccharides, and then you use them as quick energy sources. Again, the formula for these, since they have six carbons, these would actually be isomers. C6H12O6. I'll show you diagrams of them. You would not have to, to recognize like glucose versus fructose from a diagram. Fructose is actually the sugar that we find in fruits, in apples and grapes and things like that. And if you eat candy, usually they, they put fructose, like high fructose corn syrup, which is basically just fructose sort of evaporated down into a really concentrated sugar source because it's very sweet and that's what they use to make candies and things. It's, technically it's not artificial high fructose corn syrup, it's just that we've really concentrated sugar into a, a small space to create something that's very, very sweet and then, um, and then obviously eating too much sugar is not good for us. But it is our main source of energy, so that's glucose and fructose. Ribose and deoxyribose are five carbon sugars, so this would be our general formula, and um, they are not for energy. Deoxyribose is the D, the sugar from DNA, and RNA, ribose, is our sugar. So those are the, the base building blocks of all carbohydrates. If you put two monosaccharides together, you actually would get a disaccharide. You'd hook them together into, um, into one unit. Two examples of disaccharides that you would be familiar with would be sucrose and lactose. Sucrose is table sugar. It's the sugar that you would buy in a five pound bag at the store to make cookies, cake, um, when we made homemade ice cream in chemistry. That's, that's the sugar. Sucrose is the sugar that we use for that. Or when you go to um, a restaurant and they have the packets of sugar to put in coffee or tea, that's sucrose. It comes from sugar cane. Lactose, where do you see that? Right, milk and dairy products have lactose, which is a different disaccharide, which tastes different than sucrose, even though technically they're sort of isomers of each other. The same base formula, they're both disaccharides, but they behave somewhat differently. Some people can't digest lactose. They can't, when somebody's lactose intolerant, they basically have the disaccharide lactose. Normally, an enzyme comes in and assists with the hydrolysis reaction that breaks this in half. If you're missing that enzyme, or the enzyme you make is faulty, or you don't make enough of it, that's what lactose intolerance is. And then you don't feel well when you ingest lactose. Yes? So, like, does disaccharide mean Exactly. Two, two monosaccharides hooked together. And actually, what you'll see is they, the uh, monosaccharides are going to look like little rings. I'm going to show you a picture on the next slide of it. Um, so, Monosaccharides can either be drawn as a chain or as a ring. I'm going to show you both on the next slide. But I will tell you that when they are, uh, when I say uh, folded rings, when they form disaccharides, they're always in rings and they hook together into a chain. So I have a picture of it on the next slide and I actually also have a little YouTube clip. Let me show you the YouTube clip first. All right, so this is, you wouldn't have to recognize that this is glucose and fructose in particular. Um, but, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Oh, what, okay, there it goes. So this is them hooking together. So this would be a disaccharide, and notice a water molecule leaves. This next one is going to be lactose. Again, you wouldn't have to recognize that it specifically is lactose. But here's two sugars, water leaves, and they hook together. And this third one, I think, is maltose, which is another disaccharide. Again, you wouldn't have to know the difference between any of these. 
All right. So here's, let me pause it. All right, so these are three examples of disaccharides. The monosaccharides are the individual rings. They hook together disaccharides. If you were going to digest them, you would do the opposite. You would break them down. All right, so here's some pictures. So one of the ways that you can see um, monosaccharides drawn out is in a chain. Or I'll go over here to this one. If you, it's just a chain of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. If you were to add it up, you could literally count them and see that it's a one to two to one ratio. One of these is glucose, the other one is fructose. You don't have to know the difference between them. Um, technically, if we, if we really looked at it, you might recognize, or next week after you've learned your functional groups, this one has an aldehyde on the end, and this one has a ketone in the middle. But again, they're just isomers of each other. You don't have to know the difference between glucose and fructose. You just need to recognize that this is what a monosaccharide would look like. So sometimes they're drawn in a chain. Sometimes they're drawn as a ring. When they draw them as a ring, they get kind of lazy. You might say, I don't count six carbons in this, because I'm telling you it's C6H12O6. Where's the, where are the carbons? In organic chemistry, you're supposed to, to know that every bend in a ring is a carbon. It's just that it becomes really bulky. I'll show you on the next slide. It's kind of bulky when they draw it out. So they'll draw the rings, and they'll just make like a, everywhere a bend is, you're just supposed to assume that that's where a carbon is. Let me show you what I mean. On the next slide, you'll see it also here. So this one right here is drawn with the carbons all showing. And you see how it gets really bulky and takes up a lot of space. So the shorthand way of drawing a carbohydrate ring looks like that. So that's what um, monosaccharides look like. Polysaccharides are long chains of monosaccharides. So I listed some examples of those. Again, it would look just like the disaccharide, but a longer chain. Starch is how plants store their energy. So again, potatoes, wheat, rice, even corn, any of those things, those would all be examples of polysaccharides. We store our energy as glycogen. Usually if I ask people how do we store our energy, the, the common answer I'm going to get is fat, which is true. We store energy as fat for long-term storage, like weeks from now, months from now. That's, that's where we put fat, that's where we put excess energy that we're not going to need, that we don't seem to be needing on a regular basis. All right, so, but technically, yes, we store fat long-term that way, but if we were going to talk specifically about, for example, you go to bed at night, you ate dinner at 7 o'clock, you don't eat again until the next day at, let's just say you don't even eat breakfast, so you don't eat the next day until noon. What's keeping you alive from 7 p.m. that night before till noon that day? Obviously, we're not walking around hooked to an IV, so something has to be maintaining the sugar levels to feed ourselves. That's glycogen. Whenever you eat a meal, your muscles and your liver store these chains of sugar, and then you just slowly release it, almost like being on a constant IV. You need a little more energy, you release a little more glycogen and break it into glucose. If you deplete the glycogen, that's when your body would say, oh, I better go somewhere else, and that's when your body would go to fat. Fat is more where you store energy for long term, like, oh, I might need this energy a month from now, I'll store it as fat. But what gets you between meals is glycogen. Cellulose is what plants use to store their, um, or actually not store, it's for their cell walls. And chitin, and that is pronounced chitin, it's not chitin, um, is what's in the cell walls of insects. And it's also what's in the cell walls of funguses. The, um, you can't digest cellulose. That's the one I was talking about, that the way that it's put together, we don't have any enzymes to digest it. Termites can digest it because they have microorganisms in them that digest it. That's why termites can eat wood. If you do that, you will starve to death. Um, and I don't know if we can digest chitin because I don't eat insects that on a regular basis, but if anybody wants to eat insects and see if they come out the other end looking the same, you can share that with me. Um, and peptidoglycan is what's in bacterial cell walls, which I would have to assume may be somewhat resistant to digestion, because I know that there's bacteria that can survive in your stomach, and I know that there's bacteria that live in your intestines. And when people buy probiotics, those are bacteria that you're eating that specifically are supposed to survive and make it to your intestines and then help you to um, help with your immune system and vitamins and, and whatnot. So I'd have to assume that at least some bacterial cell walls are also resistant to us being able to digest them. Oops, sorry. Okay. So this is a diagram showing you would not, again, have to recognize, I wouldn't say which of these is cellulose, but you should recognize what a polysaccharide looks like. Notice how they're all chains, but they're just arranged differently. 